Hello. Hi. How y'all? Okay. You are you okay? You're Steven. Okay. Yeah. Hey, man. Hey. Yeah. We haven't interacted too much as yet. I, I I've seen some of your posts at the forum thing, and uh, let me say, oh, let me get my. I've been fumbling here trying to because it's been a long time since I've used Zoom on yeah, the, yeah. on this here, and I had not used it for a presentation in a very long time, and I've not used it for this machine. Well, let me so, uh, make make you a host, and then we can play around all we want. And Sean should be on in a second. Yeah, we have a mutual friend, Steel Hill. Um, oh yeah, God. yeah. I mean, Steel or Buddy, he he uh, sponsored our program early on back in 2010 time frame. Oh, okay, until he retired. Yeah. And so um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you were, if you remember the uh, space shuttle Atlantis dedication at Udvar Hazy, which was in around 2014 or so. I was I didn't go to that, although I've seen the shuttle there. I mean, I've been yeah. to Uvar Hase a couple times. Well, I came. And I got up grandchildren and, um, now, so it's an excuse to go visit <laughs> all these. Right. Places. Well, I came up and toured your facility uh, then with my wife and my little my oh. little van that was painted okay. with NASA stuff all over it and Soho okay. Soho stickers and everything. Yeah, and um, well, now you got to get SDO stickers. Yeah, well, I had the van was covered with graphics from SDO that still let me use. Okay, uh, but I did the solar telescopes uh, in the parking lot there during that event, and so we had about eight thousand people at that event. Oh, wait, wait a minute, are you talking about when they did the flyover or when they actually put it in the? Uh... No, it was when they were they had it nose to nose with uh, Discovery, I think, on the uh, oh no, the okay, field. no, okay. And uh, they had to let the public come in and look at it. You can still smell the burning ceramic tiles and stuff on it. It was pretty <laughs> cool. But um, yeah, we we've uh, we've been real grateful for for you and your department for a long time. But I've never yeah. never met anybody yeah. else there except Steel. Oh, okay, um, yeah, that. Um, in fact, I took Steel to I'm, Australia. I'm, I'm, what's that? I, I took Steel to Australia for two weeks to do oh, outreach. Yeah, back in yeah. 2015. Steel was, Steel was a good guy. He was the one that got me started. Um, yeah. You know, when initially when I first when they. First did the Helio Visualization Project. Yeah. He was one of the guys that had been doing it regularly with I know. Soho. I remember and, all that. And uh, I had to, uh, you know, he, he, he was someone that I often deferred to. He, yeah. SDO exclusively was his domain, and so right. we sort of like worked out the, these these areas. And then if it had to combine multiple missions together, I would do that. Right. So well, I've, that used, was your, kind I've of the... used your stuff a million oh, times. Okay, man. great. In fact, I just used some of it this past Thursday night for a lecture to a local photography association. Okay. Well, and, I don't uh, know. I've been see. stealing your work for years, man. That <laughs> so. the, it's it's out there to be stolen. It's your tax dollars at work. You know? I absolutely love it, and I couldn't think of a better job to be have the keys to the best solar telescope on the, <laughs> in the universe, and you get paid to make cool videos with it. That'd be yeah. man. That'd be it, all it, about it's that. it's really funny because I started at you know I would I. I I had a, a pretty rocky road to where I'm at right now. I, I, I grew up in South Florida. I tried going to college. I dropped out. Mm -hmm. I moved away from home for, for about five years, re-enrolled at the College of Charleston, moved to Charleston and re-enrolled there and uh, managed to finish up my degree, went straight to grad school at Clemson and um, wow, and uh, worked with the, gamma, the, the, the new Gamma Ray group that was just being started up there. And so I got a lot of uh, experience with gamma ray astronomy. In fact, the first time I started playing with a renderer was to do gamma ray transport in plasmas. Right. And so awesome. that's when I first started, first started playing with. They had very early simple renderers that you could get for free at that time. And I played with them. <laughs> and then I went, uh, I got my first job after grad school was um, uh, working in the science support center for Compton Gamma Ray Observatory at Goddard. I'm going to stop you right here, okay, and tell you this. I want you to talk this stuff on the on the thing with all of our people here. Okay. Because okay. this is the stuff I want to hear. Yeah, I this you to is get very tired informal. Of talking about it. I got a short presentation very that's informal. just yeah. basically, you know, kind of what I do and how our how our, our system works. Um, showing I don't want you to tools. lose that that first time go through of the story is always the best one. So I want you to yeah, say yeah. that. Man. Well, right. you know, I'm improvising. And I see you recording it too. So I will. Oh, no, I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to record oh. when we start, but I'll turn it oh, off okay. for now. So I'm recording and we're going to admit everybody. All right. Let's see if there's any names that are familiar to me. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. We're going to start in one minute. We're letting everybody get on board and we should have a very exciting show for you. So just hang tight for a second. Hey, Alexander, I'm going to make you a co-host. And if you see any porn, get rid of them. <laughs> Is this that hack that about with Zoom?
that hack that was reported shortly. Yeah, but we, we hope that doesn't happen. So yeah. um all right, I'm Stephen Ramsden. I'm coming to you live from Atlanta, GA. And all of you here are regulars um, and know me already as the director of the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project and the Solar Chat Solar Forum. Solar Chat's the largest forum in the world for solar imagers. And um, we only have one demand, and that's you share everything and you're friendly. Uh, this ain't cloudy nights. So we do a monthly telecon and we have, sometimes we have guests. And today we've got a oh, doozy of a guest, let me tell you. Um, Thanks to uh, Sean Johnson for working out, having um, having have Tom Bridgman with us. And we're going to talk a little bit about the NASA Space Visualization Studio. But beforehand, I wanted to tell you that this year's uh, focus for the nonprofit is going to be supporting the Tunisian group and the Brazilian group uh, of, our, of our nonprofit. So we're going to get around to that fundraising stuff next time around. Um, but for now, if you just empty your wallets and your pockets into a jar and save it for us, we'd appreciate it. But so I give these lectures around the world um, and have done a bunch of them. And so do you guys. And I think everyone here, uh, including me, has routinely pilfered uh, beautiful movies and images from the NASA Space Visualization Studio website. And if you're not familiar with that, you should be, because if you do presentations on any astronomical topic, but especially the sun, you will see the best videos on earth, man. They are absolutely fantastic. And if you can believe this, there's a dude and a, and a few more people that sit around and get paid to make these videos. They've got the best solar telescope on earth, uh, several of them. And their job is to gather all this stuff and make videos, man. This is the job for me. So I don't know where it is. <laughs> We're going to start out by welcoming Tom Bridgman from uh, NASA's Space Visualization Studio. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, I was, it was uh, interesting to be invited. I haven't done one of these presentations in a long time, so please bear with me. I'm going to try to I keep will. it kind of informal. I got a little bit of um, special stuff, but uh, presentation stuff, but anyway. Yeah. Well, we start out um, all of our guests on here by asking the most critical question of everything. And in your case, it's especially critical. Um, what is your favorite Star Trek character? <laughs> Oh, Spock, of course. <laughs> I love this guy already. The keys to my kingdom are yours, my friend. Uh, um, you know, it's funny because your name is is William Thomas Bridgman? Yes. Okay, well, that's also Commander Riker's name, right. William yep, Thomas exactly. Riker. Yep. I, I and, did that too. <laughs> do you go by Will, so you're good Riker, or are you bad Bridgman and you go by Tom? You know, I, my joke is that William is the, the professional guy and Tom is the one that's a little looser. But, well, I you know, you it, it doesn't really matter. Once. You know, it's always the guy with the goatee is the bad guy on Star Trek. Yeah, and, that's, and, that's, uh, that's right. That's right. Whenever. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to have uh, William Thomas on the show. That's a first for us, and we appreciate it. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we get started? It's going to be in English today. And if you have a question, I'd appreciate you raising your hand using the Zoom hand raising feature, which is along the bottom of the screen. And if you have to just start talking, then we'll deal with it. But let's uh, give a super, super warm and 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 great greeting to our friend Tom Bridgman from NASA. Tom, take it away. Okay, thank you. The uh, I, I will say that i first met Charlie Bates back in 2009. Uh, my, we, our family, we went down to Dragon Con in Atlanta back then. I think that was the year that Shatner and Nimoy both showed up at the same time. And I was presenting in their yeah. either science or critical thinking track. Well, and let I me was interrupt you and tell you that Charlie Bates is dead. And this yes, is Yes, yes, I do Bates. know that. Yeah. I, <laughs> you mean, I, okay, I you mean the organization. about that. But, okay, uh, all right, very good. But um uh, yeah, and I remember I was walking around around the hotel at one point, and I looked out on the, the roof, and there was a bunch of people with Celestrons and stuff like that. I said, oh, I got to go check this out. And I and I went out and, and um, chatted with him, and, and um, he, we exchanged cards and stuff like that. We kind of kept, kept in touch formally after that, but, it, but I, I had lost track of him. And then at one point, I, I did hear about his death. And, um, but anyway, that was, so I, I did have a slight connection to you know, your group back in 2009. And when I was first contacted about this, I said, wait a minute, I think I sort of know these people. <laughs> well, let me tell you, that was actually me that you met. And oh, okay. The, the, the group, I remember meeting you at, at Dragon Con and uh, okay. the group is named in memoriam to a guy that I was in the military with who died way before we ever started. Oh, so I'm that was sorry. actually me, yeah, but so everybody, totally caught, everybody does yeah. that. It's hey, okay. You know, it was over 10 <laughs> years ago. What can All I right, say? There you go. So, but anyway, okay. So that was you I met then. That's that's good. That's good to know. That's useful to know. 
but um yeah so anyway um I, to give you a little bit of of my own history in terms of how I wound up in this job um I was one of these guys that was having a hard time finding out what I knew I was interested in science but didn't know what he wanted to do after after graduating from high school I had a had a, a it's now called a gap year um and then signed up informally taking classes finally signed up for a degree program and then after a few years dropped out just short of that graduation I wandered around doing computer stuff for a few years which actually a lot of this diversion actually turned out to be very useful for me because it taught me a lot of things about working with people that I needed to learn. Um, but yeah, I uh, moved up to Charleston, South Carolina from South Florida, uh, enrolled in the College of Charleston. Uh, at one point, I said, I'm going to go full tilt, finished up my undergraduate degree, got accepted at Clemson for their astrophysics group there. Uh, and they had a, a, a gamma ray group that was just starting up uh started by uh, uh don clayton who was a nuclear astrophysics uh literally had written the book and i worked with them for a long time uh and in fact that first gave me exposure to computer graphics rendering because one of the projects i wanted to do was gamma ray transport in accretion disks around black holes. And you have to do that the way you do ray tracing. It, it now in computer graphics, you propagate a photon, you know, does it hit an electron or does it not? You know, so I, I did code like that and actually had a, a book that I found that talked about how these codes were written. So I use that as sort of my reference. So I wound up, you know, completing my, my doctorate in, in uh, gamma ray astrophysics got a job uh, supporting the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory at Goddard Space Flight Center for a few years. And of course, the thing with being on a mission is you're always like subject to the funding cycle. You know, it, go, it goes up and then it, it drops off as the mission ages and you have to go looking for something else. And if you're, if you, if you've made good friends up there and, and have a reputation for doing good work, they will try to find you another position to keep you on center. And uh, it just so happened as this opening came up, that there was an opening at the Scientific Visualization Studio. And I wasn't that familiar with the stuff, but I went over and talked to him. Back then, I was actually into computer gaming, too. So I go over there. So I messed with graphics cards, was familiar with that. I go over there, talk to, talk to them. Um, and they said, you know, the nice thing is you have a lot of experience with science. You know the data formats. You know the pro you know, programming. You're, and most importantly, you're willing to learn new stuff. And I haven't had an interest in the computer graphics side because I, I bragged about, you know, what I how I played with this kind of stuff. And that was 1999 when that happened. And at the time I took the job at, at the studio, I was like, well, you know, I guess this will be a nice place to be for about five years and then I'll go off and do something else. And I am astonished that they put up with me for this long. <laughs> But um, it, it, it's been a really fun ride. Shortly after I started, they wanted to do start a separate heliophysics visualization thing. And I was sort of like the, the founding member of that. And the, I was kind of an obvious match for that because I was familiar with astrophysics data formats and uh, had done some work with, a, with a, an earlier mission uh, called Trace, which was a, it did little subsets of the sun. And of course, there was Soho, which did the full disk, but at a much, but at a lower resolution. And so we did some, we did some experiments with that. And in fact, one thing I'll, I'll show you right now, one of my early visualizations that I did. Let's see, I'm not sure if this is gonna. I'm gonna have to switch this thing here. Uh, da, 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 where is it? Where is it? There. Let me see. Is that gonna open? So I'm gonna need. I'm gonna need to um, share switch. screen. Yeah, yeah. Let me get that that working here. Let's see. We're all Zoom meeting expert share. computer scientists here, so don't don't be don't okay, be worried we'll if it doesn't work. Ah, okay. there it is. Very good. Okay. See, so very good. Oh, it even tells me that participants see your application. So <laughs> let's start this playing. This was one of the first visuals, early visuals that I did, combining awesome. multiple data sets on a single event. And at the time I did this, no one had done this before. And we got, I had all these missions. We had Soho, we had Trace, we had Resi. Resi had been, you know, fairly new on the scene. And then, you know, you have this big solar flare that happens that you see in x-rays, and then it blows out a nice monstrous CME. So 
this was one, and they, then then the particles go and blast the detector. <laughs> so you started the multi uh, mission overlays. That What's was that? your. Uh, you started the whole multi mission overlay video thing. Uh, I don't know if I started it, but I sort of try. That was became something. It was something that that I knew I needed at some point to do. Wow. Um, as we had a conversation about Steel Hill, and you know, he was the SDO guy, and I was the guy that did SDO or Soho rather, and then I did Soho plus other missions. So awesome, that man. was one of the things that uh, we did. So let me uh, let me play it one more time to to see. Are you still seeing? Yeah. Okay. When you get done, don't forget to hit stop share so we can see you again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm seeing the button up there. Yeah. I'm kind of new to. I haven't done this much with Zoom, but yeah. Then you see the little X-ray emission yeah. down here in the two different bands, and then nice big. You know, you see the bright, the high energy stuff, and then kablooey. Awesome. And I was, I was, this was actually one of the, like I say, it was one of the early ones I did combining, um, combining mission data. And, um, it was a really fun exercise in, uh, in getting that stuff to work. And for a long time, I did stuff in, in mostly two dimensional stuff. It was Soho data. The sun was fairly active at that time. Uh, we had the big Halloween solar storms that were, uh, going on, um, and um, so, yeah, so the, the, that was that was my early, early part. And I will now switch over and try to do the, a little bit of a presentation that kind of shows off uh, what we do, what our audience is, why we do it and, and stuff yeah, like that. Cool. and give you a chance to see that. So let me. Well, see. I can tell you I'm your audience for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's great. I, I, I told him I've been stealing his work for two decades, just about. You know, you know, one, and one <laughs> thing you need to. um Sometimes it'd be useful if you if you give some presentations at at very you know at various spots to let us know that you use them because you know we always use that for you know justifying funding. We got actually if you look in our the SVS database, there's some there's sometimes a little field that says air checks. Hmm. It used to be things for when our stuff appeared on the national news, yeah. uh, but now it's stuff for like newspaper articles and presentations and stuff like that. And we'll fill in stuff like that um, on there. If we, if we get the information, we don't get as, as much as we used to, but uh, anyway, I don't know. I'll, let me stop here. Stop rattle, prattling on. And uh, anyone got any questions uh, right now before I start sort of like a, a semi-formal presentation? I think we're good. Okay. Let's see here if I can get this thing to work twice in a row. Uh, see. And Share I think screen. this is the most participants we've had on our solar chat live. So oh, far. really? How many? How so many you did good. Um, it looks like about eighteen, maybe. Oh, that's, okay. You're the man. Oh, this does not increase you. your pay, though. I'm telling you. That, but, which okay. is is currently nothing on that. <laughs> zero. Yes, it will stay at zero. <laughs> Share. Okay, you should be able to see the data visualization in space we science. Do. We do. Okay, good. All right. So yeah, we found out that this 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 method works. Let me start the slideshow part. Start from first slide. Okay. So yeah. Um, so these are some of the samples of some of the stuff that I in particular have done. Uh, this is actually sort of my title screen for a lot of stuff. And I'll talk about, I'll show some of these vi visuals in detail later on. But um, the Visualization Studio, you know, we have, uh, you know, my outline for this, you know, some, showing some samples of stuff. The, our audience, our target audience for a lot of our stuff show some of the tools that we use, uh, some of the standards that we try to observe to make sure that other people can use our stuff, and then some other details about, you know, how and why. Um, so anyway, one of the things, distinctions we like to make is the difference between animation versus data visualization. You know, animation is used for, more for cons illustrating conceptual ideas. You might want to be able to show, you know, a proton and a neutron combining to form uh, deuterium for um, for the, so showing the power of the sun. And actually, there's a visual, there's um, the animation group actually did a visualization of that. They started from the center of the sun, moved out through the, the body of the sun until finally, you know, they, they have the solar wind hitting the Earth's magnetosphere. And and forming aurora, so they do sort of like the the cradle to grave type animation of of um, the of powering the sun. I've used uh, that data... one. <laughs> I've What's used that? that one many times. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, that was that was one. They spent a lot of time on that. Um, there's also the data visualization is more driven by data. We need to have some kind of data to present um, the context for what what story we want to particularly tell. 
Uh, this one was the one I just showed you a little bit. Now, these are some of the meta. I, for some reason, it, the movie won't actually play in, in the presentation, so I went mm. and cut it out and played it separate. But these are, this is sort of the metadata of the event. This, there was a particular active region that, that we had actually done several different stories about, uh, but it was April 21st back in 2002. The data I have ranged from six hours. That was the wide field of view of, um, of the, the Soho Lasco imagery. And down to 12 seconds, which was Trace and I think Resi also had about 12 second cadence. And it covers spectrally from the optical range into X-ray. So this this was one of the things in terms of illustrating the range of scales you can do, both in terms of spectra and in time and in space. You know, I zoomed in on a, on a close into something and, and, and pulled back out and, you know, the different time scales that these processes take place on so that was one and yeah I've, I've heard from various instructors that oh yeah i use that in my class a lot <laughs> my big regret is that it's still only seven the best one is still only 720 hd i, said, I just really need to try to redo that as 4k mm. but anyway so a lot of our audience um again schools and formal education um at various times we've had groups that uh were more involved in the formal education side and that comes and goes to, depending on funding and 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 other uh, considerations a lot of our target audience is informal education the people that are fans of nasa they go to the nasa site and look at you know the twitter feed and stuff like that but we've also done a lot of stuff for museums and planetariums there's um the baltimore science uh, or maryland's it's called the maryland science center it's in baltimore near here there's a lot of our stuff up in there We've got some stuff that I think is also at, at uh, the Air and Space downtown. I'm not sure. I was at the the Uvar Hazi the um, a little over a year ago, and I can't don't remember any of our stuff there on that stuff in 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 on display there. But um, you know, so there's one point, and we do a lot of this stuff for the researchers for communicating with with uh, informal education, but sometimes for scientific conferences, uh, Astro uh, American Geophysical Union and the AAAS. Um, what's the other one we we've done recently? Uh, AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and of course, general general media. And so those are kind of the things that we try to target for that. Um, a large part of our group is earth science. And let me show, show you sort of like the range of our expertise here. Uh, we got the, um, you know, a lot of people do earth science. The nice thing about earth science is, you know, they got lots of data. You know, they have very detailed models that they'll run. Um, they, and they can do a full disk. That was one of the th things that I liked about transitioning from astro gamma ray astrophysics to solar physics was that all my images were no longer just blobs. You know, that it, there was a, you know, I went to a, 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 a Compton symposium years ago where where the, the popular ter astrophysical term was blob <laughs> for, for stuff that gets shot out from, you know, accreting black holes and stuff like that. And I said, wow, you know, the nice thing about solar data is it's not all blobs. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I got the solar and heliophysics stuff that we do. Um, the planet we've done some planetary we did a bunch of stuff uh, for using the mars um the mars laser out mola mars orbiter laser altimeter that was one of the ones that did a very detailed uh topographical map of mars we did some stuff with that um atmospheric stuff there's a visual that was done some years ago of the ozone hole and geospace what you know the region the plasma environment around the earth uh, my joke is that I, I, my domain is everything from essentially the on, the ionosphere to the edge of the solar system if it's plasma. <laughs> and I think that almost sounds like a, either a superhero or a supervillain description at times. But <laughs> that, that that is my domain. But I I need to think of a of a of a appropriate you know uh, nom de plume or no uh, whatever uh, to um, to 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 uh, make that stick. Um, we had one guy that with the astrophysics group that made this little blue alien that he used for doing the talking about black holes and stuff like that, which was apparently very popular. <laughs> right. uh, but anyway, um, some of the some of the goals of, of our visuals, one, one, you know, visualization with context. <clears throat> we want to be able to tell a story 
a particular around a particular event like the solar movie you know i was talking about all the scales that take place to for to make a solar flare uh multiple data sets not always multiple data sets but very often multiple data sets um time series stuff that varies in time um often do camera motions and change of focus and more of a you are there feel, even though it's someplace where if you were there, you would be dead. <laughs> so it's a nasty, it's a rough environment to, to try to be there. That's why you want to send your robots. Right. Um, some of the tools that we've used, um, I got some some images here. Uh, one of the, the upper left, I think that one, I think that was one. I did that one in Blender. At one time we were, Blender is an open source rendering, modeling and rendering package. It's freely available. Um, there are various astrophysics groups that have actually used it for doing um, professional grade data visualization. You know, you th think sometimes open source tools, ah, well, you know, they're not really that good, you know, that stuff. But you can do a lot of useful stuff with this. Um, at one time, we had looked at using that in the studio and didn't really do that, uh, couldn't really get it going. Um, the lower right is a tool that the group has started using more heavily called Houdini, which is a, a more of a procedural type thing. You, If you want to build an object, you put a little command set that says, OK, build a cube. And then I want to extend part of this cube to make a cylinder out or like an antenna or something like that. And so you'll you'll install a little command that that tacks that to it. Uh oh. Well, we have a freeze up on the video. Hopefully he'll be back. Bummer. You guys are all still hearing me, right? Render man. It's by there Pixar, which which okay. um a lot of you are may be familiar. Oh, it says my now you're good, connection. you're good. Okay. You, you were froze for a couple seconds, but you're back. Okay. Yeah, I was just got a note about my state. My connection was not stable. Actually, it's raining outside, so the uh, humidity sometimes impacts <laughs> my Wi-Fi in the house. It was just a couple seconds, man. You're yeah. Good. Okay. So anyway, um, so we use that quite often for our detailed rendering. Having shown you these fancy tools, I will tell <laughs> you that I don't generally use them mm. because... One of the problems I ran into early on was that space science uses a bunch of different coordinate systems, and they vary in time with respect to each other. Like, you know, you think of, oh, yes, well, something's fixed with the Earth. Well, yeah, but the Earth is also moving around the sun. And there's actually a specialty coordinate system where the x-axis always points from the Earth to the sun. So it's time varying. It varies a little bit depending on the time of year and the angular motion of the Earth and things like that. So I found it, you know, I had to either recode some very complex uh, coordinate transformations into one of these tools and hope that I'd done it right, or I could rely on some of the mathematical tools that already existed in, in the scientific community and spit them out in, and, and feed them into a renderer. And it turns out that RenderMan has a mechanism for doing this. RenderMan has a language called RIB that basically, <laughs> I don't know if you're ever familiar with PostScript. It's yes. a, it's a language where you say, oh, go to this line, go over, you know, this this many points down, this many points over, and draw a character here. Well, RenderMan has a a command language where it says, go to, you know, trans, you know, you have an origin, transform to this position, rotate your frame by this amount, draw a sphere there. And so it turned out that it was actually much more straightforward to do stuff where I did all the calculations that told me where everything was supposed to be and how things were turned and make it spit out rib to do that. So that became that when I figured out how to do that, it was like really pretty cool. Plus you can do everything in a script. You don't have to bring up the a heavyweight to interface. You can right. set stuff up where it'll run on its own overnight. And also we have a lot of this stuff is done distributed processing for data and rendering. So we actually have a render farm that's got about, 100 nodes on it right now and whenever we have a big job we can launch one of these processes and it will spit out to each computer a single frame and that computer will render a frame and then put them all in one directory and we'll just collect them all together and encode them as a movie and stuff like that so that's kind of our basic process wow um and i'll, sh I'll show you a quick uh, 
guide here as to how we do how we do stuff. You know, we have a you know at any given time, if we want to make a frame, we select the data that corresponds to that time, and sometimes we might interpolate. We convert the data to images or structures. You know, it might be a flat image that we map onto a sphere. It might be a volumetric image that we make an isosurface or something like that, or some other type of volume. We assemble these components into the scene. This is what I was talking about before about how you do the um, the um, stitching the stuff together in, in rib. You have the coordinates of everything, and and it and you pass the appropriate commands. You define actions like you, you you put them all all the pieces together, and then you render it. You might and and usually this is a command that gets sent to off to another computer. And while that computer is busy re actually rendering the image, you go on to the next step. You say, Ah, am I done yet? Nope. So you go back and do it again until finally you collect all the movies together, all the frames together, and and generate a movie. So you know, there's a question of why you'd want to do this. You know, there's the it generates. A, a better quality product. There's a lot of tools that you can use. Actually, a lot of the graphics tools now uh, available to scientists do a lot better than this. They've actually put some fancier uh, rendering capability in, in desktop tools. Um, Interrelationships between the data are not always obvious. We've had cases where there was one mission, they were one to launch it so that it its orbits took it into the magneto tail of the Earth to look at reconnection. And they found out from one of my visuals, it looked like they were being, they were going, their orbits were tilted a little bit low for the spot they wanted to be in. <laughs> so wow. they, they tweaked the orbit. Um, education and press releases, you know, it generates a prettier looking product that people, that people like to see. Indeed. And of course, reuse, which, you know, Mr. Ramson has, has <laughs> told me repeatedly he likes to do. And, and I think that is fantastic. Um, Here's a couple of references of people that are using Blender for this kind of stuff. Uh, I've I've met both uh, Jill Naiman and Brian Kent uh, on several occasions and chatted with them about this. And AJ Christensen, it might be a familiar name to uh, to to Sean there, uh, which he now works with us now directly. So, um, but anyway, so those are just some of the got the the resources that are freely available and mo most actually the book there may not be freely available, mm. but um, Anyway, for other people that are doing it, for if you really want to get into it, and uh, some of the standards we try to do, you know, back back years ago, we did standard def, and we still got stuff out there that's in standard def TV, uh, unfortunately, but that we started moving where we routinely generate 1080 HD and 4K HD. And we got a couple of other open source tools, FFmpeg and Handbrake that are used for encoding things. Um, and oh yeah, this oh this was a little simple movie that I I'd, I'd put together to show. Um, we I can do that a little bit later if we want to see it. And just some of the technical challenges you run into is making sure that everything's lined up, time synchronization of stuff. Uh, very often you'll have you know one instrument on one spacecraft is taking snapshots at a certain time and 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 different sampling than another instrument. You got to try to decide how you want to interleave those together when you put them together. Physical scales and renderer precision. A lot of computer graphics renders are single precision. There are tricks that let you do higher precision stuff, um, but it, it gets involved. Various limitations of the renderer, uh, and uh, some of these are just get really more complicated. And one of the ch challenges that I get regarded particularly for my job is the tools that the scientists have on their desktops are getting pretty sophisticated. So I need to stay ahead of them. For a lot of the stuff that I do, um, there one of the things is that there's a big push about. Oh yes, you can do stuff interactively. Well, there's some data sets that are so complicated that you can't really do them interactively, and so we leave uh, a lot of our stuff. We'll we'll try to to do it. Uh, yeah, the really heavy duty stuff. Um, one of the other challenges is these are all commercial rendering packages where they're prime market are you know the big studios and stuff like that they they want to do the next marvel movie um scientific users are not their primary customers we we use render man but and and some of our folks have actually visited pixar and they're really pleased that nasa is using their stuff so actually we have a little bit of leverage when they we, we've had several things in these latest iterations of render man where they chopped out something we used and we're like 
no, we can't get by without that. And thank goodness there's other people that say that too, that they that there was some feature that they chopped out. And so we get a lot, but we're kind of a, a high visibility customer. So we actually get some of the features get uh, re-enabled. And of course, physics-based renderers is, is another thing that's popped up. It used to be that computer graphics worked like the old, um, the old model of how vision worked, where a ray was shot out from your eye to look at things. And then you would see the reflection back. That was the computer graphics model. Nowadays, they are actually doing actual ray radiation transport in a lot of these packages where they will have a light source and it spews out light rays and it hits an object. And if it comes back and hits your eye, well, okay, you've got part of your image right. but or, or where your camera is. But um, if it doesn't, you don't necessarily see it. There's actually... Uh, mechanisms they have for trying to make it so that that you you don't waste as many fo as many photons that you send out as you would um, on there. So I'm going to see. I think that's the last. Yeah, it's the last uh, part of that. So anyway, so that's sort of like my official presentation. And I got some movies here that uh, we can talk about if if uh, you want. Um, let me do, let me close that. All right. But um, yeah, um, any other questions at this point or? Did you say that a lot of the instruments, uh, the data you get is, uh, is, is on different axes, then they're not all on the same type axes. And that's what you're talking about, having to coordinate these different axes together in your videos? Yeah, that's what, well, um, you know, like there's a number of coordinate systems that are convenient for doing some of the science. Like when you're on a, sol a solar observing spacecraft, if you're at the, uh, if you're SOHO at the L1 point, you're in a different coordinate system. And so, and SOHO moves in this kind of, uh, in fact, I can, I got a visual, I can show you the, the, tra the trajectory of it. But that when you're looking at, at that, and then you might have another telescope that's in another position, but you have those two different coordinate systems that form those image planes. Right. And you have to try and merge those together. In fact, one of the interesting challenges, where is it? Ah, here it is. Let me let me bring this up uh, and share this. Oops. One of the challenges when when uh, Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter launched, there was a lot of talk about, you know, we're going to be able to use these missions together and do stuff. So you should be, okay, so you should be able to see a movie you're looking down on top of the solar system. I do right now beautiful and so we got the sun in the center uh earth and soho are over here we got stereo a unfortunately stereo b you know it kind of bit the dust back a few years ago parker solar probe is in this highly elliptical orbit that keeps getting closer to the sun this is the magnetic field lines of the sun go, re, or represents the magnetic field of the sun go, propagating outward and so one of the things they wanted to do was say, okay, well, there's a bunch of different scenarios where, where, um, let's just play in here. Oops, where's the control? There it is. Yeah. So we got this thing here. We said we slowly have it, you know, Parker Solar Probe, when it's far out from the sun, it's moving kind of slow. Uh, this one's actually one focused on a particular event that happened um, ah, last almost exactly a year ago. But, you know, one of the things you're interested in. Okay, you've got two missions that are re measured that can or, that are along this similar field line that can measure the plasma density along this line. So you get right. a measurement of it here, and you get a measurement of it out there. So that's useful in terms of seeing how do the properties of the plasma change. Yeah. Then you have these imagers, and you see they're all sort of like oriented in 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 different angles and stuff like that. So when you want to bring them together, you have to do a coordinate transformation to kind of bring them in together <laughs> on there. But, um, and here's, you know, the other missions might pass along the same magnetic field line. So you want to measure, gee, what's happening here? And what do we measure down downstream from that? That is awesome. So man. there's all kinds of things that you can do with those measurements that tell you about the evolution of the plasma as it's moving out to the solar system. Yeah, I think that's incredible. Uh, it's just fascinating to watch. That was my only question. Okay, let's see. So anyway, but that's that's one of the examples uh, where I've had to use multiple coordinate systems. It gets more complicated than that when I'm looking at Earth science stuff because again, like like I said, you have stuff that's fixed to the Earth, 
in the geographic coordinate system. But then there's stuff that you have to worry about the Earth's rotation, stuff that varies on a day a day time scale, and then stuff that varies on the year time scale as the sun angle changes and the incline and the inc relative inclination of the Earth's of uh, the body of the Earth changes. Um, I've got one little piece that I can show of that. And this was one that I was particularly proud of when I finally got the darn thing working. Um, we had these two missions that were studying the ionosphere up close. And yes, there. Okay. So you're looking at the night side of the Earth. The sun is off in this direction. I don't know if you can see. Can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, and there was a mission called ICON that was going to measure various properties. There's a bunch of little marks you see on here. These are actually the upper level atmospheric winds. <laughs> so you'll see stuff change on these different time scales. Like the, the winds are tied to the geographic coordinate system. The magnetic field is tied, of course, also to the geographic system. But then the atmosphere changes based on the direction of the sun. And so we'll watch, watch as things play here. Icon goes swinging around the earth. Now the South Pole's over on this side. So that's yeah. so, and we're going over an area here that's over uh, the, kind of the central Atlantic off the tip of, um, of uh, South America where the earth's magnetic uh, equator actually does a little jag. And so you see here, the sun's coming up now. You see the upper atmosphere winds moving away from the sun as the earth heats yeah. the, as the sun heats the upper atmosphere this stuff starts rushing away you get this ionization taking place in the upper atmosphere that is actually guided by this magnetic field it's kind of, it's kind of like a slug that's crawling around the earth yeah. around the, and it follows this the, the action of the sun as the ionization takes place the magnetic field sort of herds the ions into these two little channels and i've got an actually a separate visual on that but this is one of the things that i that icom was launched to study and then of course as as the afternoon uh changes and the sun angle changes you'll see up oh, the wind's starting to go back the other way now because the sun is now behind us and the wind is pushing away from the under the sun and moving towards the night side of the earth in the upper atmosphere and so this was actually this was actually a real challenge to do, but I had a blast doing it because I put I had not pulled these types of data sets together. But again, different different coordinate systems that you have to manage. Yeah, you know, incredible. keeping the sun direction synced up with the data set. These are all based on uh, models too. This this was something that was done for the pre-launch of Icon, which um, we wanted to show. And I'm told that that's actually you know there was the scientists they showed like a real simple very schematic view of it in some presentations. I said. I think I could do better. <laughs> so I think I you did. A, yeah, <laughs> that was pretty impressive. Data to try to make something pretty out of that. Um, but yes, see, how's my time going here? Okay, I'll show off a few more things that I'm particularly proud of here. Um, my this is the one that I call Argo Sun. I wanted to call let's see, ah, which I assume that a lot of you may have seen and have used at one time or another. Um. Let's see. Let me get that thing sharing. Do, 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 there. Okay. Oops. Where's oh there? Clicked on the wrong thing. So yeah. Um. This 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 was kind of a funny piece because I was originally trying to look at how much you could see of the chromosphere in SDO, and one of the scientists said it's only about eight pixels wide. And but I had to go and prove it for myself. So I put up this this scenario of how I would test really close to the so, limb of the sun where the stuff where the atmosphere was and see the offset between the photosphere and the upper level of the chromosphere. So I had had this arrangement here where I had to synchronize the data sets really closely. And. It was one of those things where I put it together and I looked and I said, you know, I can't really see the chromosphere that well. But, it, but I we used to have it played on one of my screens in my office. And I looked at that and says, you know something? That's the most artistic, bloody thing I have ever done. <laughs> and yeah, I've seen that in, a million times. I've seen that one everywhere, man. That's, yeah, that's and I, I want to put it on a T-shirt. But, you know, take one of these <laughs> images here and get it on a T-shirt. But the, one of the cool things about it that I think is really informative is when you see various features of the sun, wait till that sunspot comes back through, you see how it looks in different wavelengths. You know, there's a little bit of a, a 
plasma flow there, you see these filaments that are visible in one frame, one <laughs> wavelength filter, but not in another. Or it might be bright in one filter and not and dark in another. And that was just so cool. And this is one of the ones that I love showing uh, when I do presentations at our Hyperwall at the studio. Um, and, you know, we got that sunspot there. You can see, you see the loops and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was able to do it anime. I've been meaning to try and make a, 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 a way to do this for any data set you want. It's really pretty data intensive, though, because you have to download the whole data set for everything you want to look at and at full at a reasonably high cadence and and composite it together and these th these images are basically 16 let's see they're 4k by 4k so they're 16 megabytes each right. in raw size and then you have to stitch them you know take the slice of them and stitch them together uh, appropriately uh coordinated but i was like you know this is this is one of, one of my favorite pieces that I like for show, sure. why do we, to answer the question that gets asked a lot, why do we look at the sun in different wavelengths? You know, there's people that will look at the images from SDO and they'll go, the sun doesn't look like that. <laughs> but this is the sun that you can only see from space. Right. I so, love this one because it shows all the different temperatures also. Yeah. How, how yeah. Different Because it really compares to looking through at the sun through a H alpha scope versus a calcium scope. The yeah, difference in the yeah. prominences is really evident in this video, and it looks the same way in the telescope. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, oh, yeah, I, I need to get, let's see. I'm getting a little bit short on time here, but let's see what we do. So let me stop share. You'll but, have to cancel uh, your next appointment, man. I don't know what you're going to. But... <laughs> uh, we don't, thankfully, it's all rainy and nasty outside here. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be going to too many places. But uh, so if, it, if we run along and people are willing to listen to me prattle on, I, I have no problem with that. Right. Uh, let's see. I've got some other stuff here that I might want to show. Well, anyway, let me do one thing because I, I was looking at the, some of the visuals that you guys had on your site. And um, I, I said, you know, uh, well, let's see. You know, th there was one question about a connection between um, one of the uh, features that was that was seen. And uh I'm told that a lot of you are familiar with these pack, these programs called Helio Viewer and J Helio Viewer. Yep. Yeah, we yeah. use it. Yeah, the Helio Viewer is a nice one if you just want to go to a website and look at what the sun looked like and look at it in different wavelengths from SDO. J Helio Viewer lets you do stuff a little bit more sophisticated. And let's see if I can actually get that to work. That'll be the next challenge. Let's see. Oops. Uh, that's not right. Where to go? There. Is this or nothing? Yeah, I'll do. I'll do Star Trek lines too. <laughs> Very good. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, always, always love that. Where's the antimatter transducer? <laughs> <laughs> Glory to your house. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was picking on one guy about they had the computer do something weird on on, on stuff, and I said, I said, uh, so I posted it says, um. The the room appears to be empty. It, it appears to be run by computer. And, and and one guy picked up. That's a Klingon quote, isn't it? <laughs> which no one else gets this except it, Star Trek Three. Me you know, and you are the only one who gets this, man. I think you and I are probably the only ones. Uh, really, no, we can't be the only nerds on this call, can we? <laughs> um. Okay, so let's see. So uh, let me go and share this screen. Do, 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 do. Yeah, there's a package called JHelio Viewer that is an actual application you can download. And uh, so, yeah, it kind of comes up looking like this. Uh, there's lots of different features you can you can do with it. You can load a, a, a range of times. Uh, it only at, at best will download about 90 or 100 frames for any data set that you get. So if you choose a large amount of data, there'll be a big gap between them. If you choose a short amount of time, it, it, they'll be kind of close together. And this is actually fed off of a, a um, an archive called the Quick Look Repository. Mm -hmm. um, but there's little tricks you can do like, okay, well, let's, say, let's take a look now. We want to look at, say, what the sun looks like in 171. So we can load, add a layer. It's kind of Photoshop-y in that regard. Uh, it looks a lot like Photoshop. And you can do, and you can look at these. You can zoom in, use the scroll wheel on the mouse to zoom in, pan around the image. You can turn have a coordinate system on there, or turn it off, whichever. You can put a timestamp on it down at the bottom. And uh, let's see, where's there? 
want to make the timestamp a little bit bigger. And you could do do simple things like this. Uh, see, this one here is actually pulling all the try, trying to download data between the 10th and 12th of February. And um, so then you can you can get it to download the day. Oh, let me turn off that mini viewer there first. That's kind of annoying. If you're zoomed in, it's really useful to have it. Mm -hmm. But um, okay, now it's downloading a little bit more. Ah, there it goes. So you can go and you know make your own movies with it. Um, for a while, these the both of these packages, both J Helio Viewer and Helio Viewer, kind of fell out of out of uh, maintenance or something like that. They weren't uh, updating it. Uh, and so a lot of people I know that that it used to rely on it were like, uh, we can't get it to work for our stuff anymore. But it's great for getting a good view of the sun for whatever you want to, um, you know, you want to identify a feature. A lot of your stuff that you guys look at in H Alpha, of course, is uh, closely so closely more closely tied with 304 mm -hmm. uh, filter. So I'll load that up. You can bring in more than one filter at a time. Um, let me turn off the 171, but yeah, actually, you can you can also blend the layers, so you get these mm -hmm. funky funky things here where you'll see the both the loops and the uh, and the, um, the 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 other features. Um, but yeah, you can also do stuff like uh, actually encode a movie, short movies on here. Like I say, you're kind of limited to about 100 frames for them, so your sampling is determined a little bit more by that. Um, but yeah, so there's various cool stuff like that. And I, and uh, if you just uh, Google Helio Viewer or J Helio Viewer, it'll take you to the websites that um, that ha that host this stuff. Uh, J Helio Viewer is available Mac, PC, Linux. Um, and yeah, I remember how it kind of fell out of maintenance for a couple of years there too, but it seems to be working back again now. You yeah, the, Mac yeah, there was a, a, a year or so ago when the sun was getting active again. I think uh, I used to talk with one of the guys that was involved in maintaining it, and uh, I hadn't heard from him in a long time, but I, I hear he's now part of the the head of like the, or at least last I heard, he was head of like the Helio division over for ESA. Oh, so, but yeah, I mean, you see all these the, the filaments launching off here. Also, you can do tricks like uh, save the state, save a given state. Like I went and saved some of one of the events you guys were looking at the other day that you mentioned on there. So let me load it up. Oh, oh, good. My stuff must still be cached. Cool. Um, so yeah, you had this this thing over here where there you had this really nice shot of this this filament that's just launching up out of out from this active region that was just really cool. It doesn't look quite the same in three hundred four on here but let's see what we get yeah yeah they're popped up pop. there's <laughs> cool. some there's some kind of gap there too yeah that's another thing for for um for sdo there is you know various oh i know what this is this is the earth eclipse where um sdo is right now in the middle of eclipse season ah. and the sun and the earth is occasionally blocking it when the when the spacecraft passes through the node off the earth sun line yeah because we we're actually doing this regular product now where we sample about every two minutes and do a whole week at, at, at 171, and we call it the sun this week, and they'll usually do a, a little bit of a feature, like if there was there something interesting or something particularly pretty, um, and, and we'll do that, uh, present that on a weekly basis. So, yeah, one of the things I was noticing a lot, you know, eclipse season is supposed to end sometime early this this coming week. So you don't see the earth bumping in front of, there's actually a calendar that you can check to find out was there an earth eclipse or was there a, uh, um, sometimes they'll do a calibration maneuver. You'll, you'll see it do this, li this little thing where it makes a little cross type pattern in the, mm -hmm. in, in, in the field of view when they're checking out the, the, um, the alignment for stuff. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of little things like little treats like that. Um, have any of you downloaded the 10 years of SDO? Yep. Of yeah, course you, you have. used it a million times, man. <laughs> <laughs> Still but, really uh, like that one too. <laughs> yeah, that 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 was that was a real challenge. It took a long time to pull all that data to it retries and stuff like that yeah. not to mention all the disk space. Unfortunately, we had a disk problem uh, a few months later and we with that with the drive that stored that data. Thank goodness it was a data that we could actually replace, but it would take a very long time to replace it. Right. But anyway, so J Helio Viewer is a tool that's freely available, um, you know, for anyone to use just to browse 
browse data if they want to uh, do that. Um, Helio Viewer is good for any like any quick look. Very often, uh, you know, if someone says, oh, there was a flare at such and such, and I need to find out what times I need to, to extract data for if they want to do very uh, the full SDO resolution, I will use Helio Viewer to find out, okay, when did this event happen? When did it settle down? Because that's always a question. You know, you want to usually use include like maybe an hour before the flare actually fired off and then three hours after. But sometimes it does interesting stuff and you want to let it extend a little bit longer. You don't want to have to go back and re retry pulling down, down extra no. data. Um, but yeah, so that that's that's an example of um, some of the tools that, that uh, awesome, I use. Man. So, um, and let's see, anything else I want to talk about? Oh, yeah, we talked about some citizen science stuff, which I do have a list here that I made. Oops. Oh, wrong program. And I'll send the I'll send this uh, to, to Steve. I don't know if I should send it to you or or Sean. It's basically just a list, and it has links to some of the resources I've talked about here, and also various citizen science projects. That uh, most of them are NASA affiliated. Um, and uh, let me share this. Screen. Yeah, I probably got Kate and all that stuff in there. What's that? No, nothing, nothing. I'm talking to myself. Let's see. Oh, there's there's the right screen. Uh, so yeah, just a little bit of a. Oops. Yeah, that would be great. So Helio Viewer, Jay Helio Viewer, the Visualization Studio, Aurorasaurus is a group that actually actively participates in a lot of our Helio conversations. There's a bunch of um, you know they got a website where you know where are you? Do you see the you know here's the Aurora forecast. Do you see an Aurora? You know, it's a mm -hmm. very simple thing. Sun Grazer product uh, project. This I've actually worked a little bit with this guy, and I did a visualization some years ago of a bunch of comets that were detected by SOHO and SDO, um, and there and they were able to get you know reasonably good ephemeris on. So I went and implemented all the ephemeris in the orbits and and uh, plotted it. Doing solar jets. That one might be inactive right now. There's a bunch of things. For for ham radio operators, the, um, the monitoring the you know, the ionosphere and stuff like that, um, and the other radio Joe project is uh, that, that one's actually been around for quite some time. They, they I think they actually have some tutorials on how to build a small radio telescope, wow. <laughs> which is pretty fascinating. Um, and Harp, there's another. It's another sort of a, like listening for plasma waves. I think this one they already have the data. You're just supposed to like. There's just so much that it's more like you know browse through it and listen to it. Do you see, hear anything unusual? Um, some of this stuff, strange. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, and and Helio Viewer uh, has this too. You'll find these things. They're actually trying to do a lot of machine learning stuff to identify some of these features. So. Just to tell you right off the bat, on some of this stuff, if you're identifying it, you might be making the training set, set for an AI system. So if you have an issue with that, you know, there's a lot of controversy right now about how AI has been used for writing and and stuff like that. And, you know, my joke about AI is that it's just a way to teach computers to be as stupid as people. Yes, <laughs> biased. indeed. <laughs> so. But you know, there's things like that. They're they're useful if you you're able to you know to help narrow down the searches. Sometimes, um, Globe Observer is a more climate and Earth science oriented thing. Uh, Eclipse Soundscapes is one of these things. I I went I went to Clemson for the 2017 eclipse because uh, surprisingly enough, they had been dead set. They were practically dead center on the track, and I had also gone to the the eclipse in Curacao back in 98. That was the only other eclipse that I'd gone to. But yeah, and there you were out in the desert, so you didn't get to notice any animals. But yeah, the one at Clemson, there was a lot of birds around and stuff like that. And then as, as the light got down, all of a sudden, all the night bugs start start chirping and everything. And it was just one of those really weird feelings. Like, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. the sun's high up in the sky, but all these critters think that it's nighttime is coming. But um, so that's one of the fascinating things there you know i, I see i know there's, there's a bunch you said there there was a bunch of birders that are in your group and i'm not an active birder but i keep a bird feeder and a bird bath and a, and a squirrel corn bungee out out in Good the yard you. that provides Good endless hours of entertainment you know we, we have a section of our program that teaches about different wavelengths in nature and how animals and plants use it so yeah I, I, yeah okay maybe you can answer this question do squirrels see in color yes 
They do. Well, they have a wider sensitivity to color than we do. I don't know what they're actually seeing in their brains. Okay, yeah. But they should be able to see a little bit more in the UV and the IR than we can. Really? Okay. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's interesting. Because I, I was always wondering. I do. I once tried to do the trick of putting the mirror out in the yard to see if they would, you know, get interested in it, and and they totally ignored it. They actually, they actually seem to be looking at their reflection in the, in like the the French glass French doors that we have. They'll sit out there and eat something, and I don't know if they know they're looking at themselves or or whether they. Yeah, think, that's a big know, question. That's a big yeah. question because you know birds uh, routinely we'll attack the glass. Out. You know, birds routinely attack glass. Or yeah. review mirrors yeah, until they, they'll yeah. even die attacking themselves in a review mirror. But yeah, yeah those we are have all a little bit of questions. a problem with it with uh, our our glass French doors. We had a crow that got injured, I think, because it was on the ground and it probably looked up at these glass doors and saw Smack. the sky reflected behind it on a clear day, and it took yeah. off and it injured itself. And I saw him limping across the yard. I and and it was it was going over the one spot and a fox got it. And I was like, oh. Mm. That's how, it, that's, how that yeah. that's how it works that happening yeah that's how it works but it was it was really kind of uh you know it's one of those things we, we have enough wildlife you know we're, we're suburban but we have enough wildlife in our area that you know it provides interesting uh visuals occasionally we have some pal uh, occasional pelated woodpeckers we used to have a, mm. a northern flicker that used to r make machine gun noises on my roof vent um so you are a birder but it, <laughs> sort of <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I don't, I don't follow, I do like to be able to identify them. Um, we've had some, uh, some interesting ones. We had a little blue guy, uh, back this past fall that, I, um, we, we were able to identify it. I can't remember what it was now, but it's uh, probably a LBG. Yeah, LBG? A little blue guy. Yeah. A little, little blue, blue guy. guy. <laughs> yeah. But, so uh, are, are you, um, can you take a question now? Sure. Absolutely. I want to do uh, sh show you something that meant a lot to me, even though it's not very fancy compared to the stuff you've shown us today. But um, I'm going to share a screen with you. Sure. Uh, see if I, I turned off my sharing, right? Yeah. Okay. Not very fancy. But this particular uh, animation that, that I believe you you constructed and put out. Yeah. Of the giant filament eruption on, on uh, August 31st, 2012. Yeah. Oh, seeing, that guy, yeah. That? Yeah, let me rewind it a little bit. There you go. The filament on the bottom left just blowing yeah. off the side. Yeah. It was really special for me because I was at Dragon Con, uh, and I had a little 12 or 13-year-old girl who was operating the cameras that, at that time, and she recorded this uh, in in um, in calcium K and hydrogen alpha. Oh, wow. And, and we had a huge crowd around us. Everybody couldn't believe it because the, the entire event lasted maybe 20 minutes. Right, um, yeah. And, that and, scale, yeah, it's really incredible. Yeah, and this uh, ended up with a photo that, uh, of course, never got any traction in the real world because there's no twerking in it. Um, but let me share that to you. Ended up with a photo that's really been very special for me, uh, which was the photo that this girl and I took together of the prominence in Calcium K. Can you see yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I won't go into the standard line I do about Alexander Hart on this one, Alexander. I'm sure you're glad. <laughs> but... Um, it, it it got some traction in the astronomy community. And this was uh, the largest prominence, you know, I believe ever recorded from inside the Earth's atmosphere. And yeah. I was really, really proud to have recorded this with this little this little kid at Dragon Con. Yeah. And um, when I went to the visualization studio, I know I've been referring to it as the space visualization studio. Yeah, actually the science the, visualization. You said, yeah, um, scientific, yeah. It just made me feel really good, man, that I was able to put this super awesome 4K video along with this photo and my own video of the entire thing. And it was just a really, really great thing to have. And I appreciated it being available to us. So, so thank you for that. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the 2012 event, that was something where initially when it happened, I did not know about it, but I started getting the, the, one of the, the headquarters people kept asking me this question about stuff that was happening around July of 2012. <laughs> and when I started hearing about that, Oh, wow, this was a big CME that it could have sent us back to the stone age. Yes. If it did. yes. And that's part <laughs> I was of my like, lecture, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I went and started drag downloading as much data as i could on that event the stereo a and b right i got those those uh, image series sdo and um you and know when i say that stone age line no one believes it they think you're exaggerating but that's not an exaggeration we just have yeah, to be in the we, right place we, at the right time there was a lot of places that would have been <laughs> impacted by it i mean i mean it's interesting that i work occasionally with the ccmc which is the community coordinated modeling center and they do the research grade cme modeling 
which is then sent, uh, which then gets implemented at NOAA for their space weather forecasting. But there's a lot of stuff with the electrical grid that is tied into them, and they get notifications like, "Hey, there's a there's a fairly big event coming." Um, yeah. You know, you might want to shut down the long distance lines a little bit. You know, it's better to have, you know, a little bit of a brownout for a time yeah. than a blackout for, you know, months. Um, well, there was another big event that happened um, in that same solar maximum. And I was an air traffic controller at the time. And we got a, uh, a notice from from Washington FAA to implement uh, this particular procedure, which was only done during a solar storm. And nobody in my facility had a had a clue what anyone was talking about up there. <laughs> um, because it never happened before and i was a superstar that day because i was the only one that understood it. that and understood knew, what they were knew, talking about yeah, yeah. And, and uh i knew i even i even had a solar telescope in my vehicle at the time that i set up on a break and and showed people what was going on yeah. in h alpha but it was really cool to have this website to go to although it wasn't on there at the time but yeah. i knew what i was talking about and that comes from your department and um well, thank if, you. if if you have time i was going to open it up to uh to anyone else who wants to talk, because everybody I, you know, knows I, I can talk. I, I'm, I'm willing to stretch a little bit longer here. I, like I said, I haven't done one of these in a, in a long time, and it, and it, it is, if it's an enthusiastic group, I'm happy. <laughs> All right, so Izzy, welcome, by the way. Nice to see you. And, and uh, of course, Nick and the rest of the gang. So go ahead, anybody that wants to make any comments or has any questions, just unmute yourself and have at it. In um, English. Can I can I just say thank you very much? It's been a, a really really interesting um, talk. Um, I didn't know anything about that Jay Helio view. And I'm, okay, uh, good. I got one cover. new one new. Yeah, yeah, that looks fantastic. <laughs> yes. Um, but what I wanted to ask was, um, how long is SDO going to be in service? Um, That's a good question. Sadly, we lost Stereo <laughs> yes. B, and that's never been replaced. Yeah. So. Um, I didn't know what new ones were going to come up because it would be a real great shame, you know, like for amateurs and professionals. If yes. SDO. Yeah. I, I have, I am not privy necessarily to plans for ongoing missions. There's a lot of missions right now that are doing stuff that um, will um, look at particular solving particular problems like the acceleration mechanisms for the solar wind and stuff like that. Um, NOAA does a fair amount of this stuff. There are solar imagers now being routinely installed on the GOES spacecraft. Um, SXI, I've worked with, so it's been a while since I've worked with with, um, with those imagers, but yeah, the GOES spacecraft actually have solar imagers on them now that do in several um, ultraviolet and soft X-ray wavelengths. So you get some coverage from those. And they're, they're in geosync, well, they're actually more in geostationary orbit, uh, and uh, SDO is in geosynchronous. Um, so they're going to have kind of pretty similar coverage. Uh, so at least for the events on the sun, that stuff is kind of covered. There's there's a procedure for launching new GOES, you know, designing and launching new GOES satellites. They started putting uh, solar imagers on them back in 2013 or 2014 thereabouts when I think I first worked with them. Um, and, uh, so, so that part will be covered. The big loss right now are coronagraphs. I mean, Soho has been such a workhorse. I mean, just a few months ago, it passed what 25th anniversary wow. somewhere thereabouts. Um, and the stereo coronagraphs just did not, were, did not live up to the, the beauty of the, the Soho coronagraphs. Um, they did have one of them that they lost when, Early on in the Soho mission, the the thing got <laughs> due to a bad command. It got turned in such a way that that it was it lost its lock on either the antenna or on the sun or something like that. And um, they it took them a, a month or two to recover it, but they lost one of the inner coronagraphs on there. So there you see a C two and a C three, but there used to be a C one <laughs> in close. But yeah, the coronagraphs that see that, that identify the CMEs are is kind of the big loss on that so i don't i haven't heard of anything that is planned beyond that but um you know i'm not exactly privy to that stuff i don't you know if, if someone comes to us and says oh yeah we're planning to do a proposal for a new coronagraph mission we need to have some nice stuff for that then i'll know <laughs> if someone's working on something right. and we very often get hear about you know someone's pre-launch or mission planning stuff at various times and, and get involved in that but it's it's fairly it's fairly rare 
the the cool thing right now is that a lot of the capability I have, especially for for doing SDO stuff, is readily available on the Scientist desktop. Either you use something like J Helio Viewer. There used to be you used to have to use this package called IDL to pull down solar data and make these images, um, but they've since you know the astrophysical and astronomical community have gone whole hog into Python, and so there is packages like. AstroPy, which does great jobs at keeping the time systems and coordinate systems straight. There is SunPy, which will you can say, I want this data for this filter from this time range at this sampling and pull it down. And um, and you can do that, do that kind of stuff. Um, and there's AIA Pi, which is the, the fancy version that cleans up the AIA imagery and, and makes it look more like uh, the professional grade stuff. Usually I have to do stuff where, you know, for like making the movies, sometimes the spacecraft is pointing off a little bit. And so you want to bring those into alignment and they will do that kind of stuff um, for you mathematically. They'll reproject the data set and stuff. Uh, one of the things with J Helio viewer, you gotta be careful of sometimes it can do a 3d view of the sun. So you can sort of like go obliquely and look, look behind it if you want to composite like another instrument in like, excuse me, stereo or something. Um, so you can do stuff like that in, uh, um, with that. So you can work with multiple data sets, but yeah, the, the, a lot of the tools the scientist has available in the their desktop for solar data is, you know, the stuff that I'm doing now is mostly more focused for public outreach. Um, Very good. Making, making sure that uh, there, there's stuff that, that focuses on a particular event so that uh, people can see it or they can put it on, on Twitter or, or do a social media post or something like that. And then uh, one of the, one of the producers, he, he does a, like a, the, uh, um, an annual wrap up of SDO. Of course, it's been kind of quiet the past few years during Solar Minimum. But so I, but but I've been starting doing retreat data retrievals for more uh, uh, events. You know, solar filaments interesting that are interesting uh, flare launches. You know, I think I think someone posted that their image of that thing that just sort of like looks like a flame shooting out from the side of the sun the other day, mm. which is like, oh, I've got that one. That's on my to do list. Right. <laughs> That's Steve, I think. Uh, it may have been yeah <laughs> so uh listen man it's just been fantastic having you on here and i'm really grateful Oops, that, that it froze worked. okay yeah i think steve been... steve's got a question oh, okay very sure. good okay not a question but a big thanks from a somebody who does outreach or used to do more outreach than they do now um in the planetarium mobile planetarium uh, right. and classrooms it's just brilliant that this stuff is available Yes. Uh, from yourselves and ESO, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm That's still it. there. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh man, I back? can't believe you missed that. It was such okay, a heartfelt thing again. <laughs> yeah, they're complaining about my internet. It's it's still I still hear the rain falling outside, so the humidity's got my Wi-Fi flaky. Uh, Steve Robinson in the UK was giving you just a warm, heartfelt thank you for all the help with his oh. research. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. It's um, the still I run a mobile planetarium and do classroom stuff and. It's just great that this stuff is available from yourself, yeah. Well, yeah. yourselves, and ESO, et cetera, et cetera. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It thank you. And yeah. it is a great resource for us. Very good. Yeah, I, I, I uh, one of the interviews I did a few years back, someone was pointing out that, yeah, all of our stuff is freely available because it's it's done at taxpayer, you know, with taxpayer money. So it needs to be freely available. And a lot of other sciences, they have to rely on like an artist or something, someone like that that always has their stuff wrapped up in copyright. Right. And I had not thought of it in that particular context before, but it was kind of fascinating to get that perspective from from um, media publishers. The uh, Universe Today crowd uh, said, "Yeah, it's right, really right, great. Right. Yeah, we can use your stuff all the time, and it's right. great that it's available." Very good. So it's nice to know it's being reused. Okay. Outstanding, man. Um, listen, I don't, I don't know what to say except thank you for this because uh, thank this you. Has been a fantastic hour to spend with somebody who's really knows what they're doing. <laughs> oh, I and, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I am not a, a I, I, I know just enough solar physics to get myself in trouble. <laughs> You're in the right crowd. There, I, de my I defer to, to to the expert to the experts on the, on that that know a lot more of the physics you, than I you do. Are, uh, in the right but, crowd. Uh, 
yeah thank but, you Sean, uh, for it's, it's really it's really fun stuff that i that i enjoy doing like i said i when i first got the job i was sort of like well oh, maybe i'll be here for five years and that was over 20 years ago and I, and you know I'm, I'm looking at you know trying to and, and and i suspect that i may try to do some more of this stuff even after i retire yeah <laughs> yeah then you maybe you can copyright it but we we always do everything free on our page we don't sell anything we don't you know nobody on this page cares whether you use their videos or not i don't think um, uh, well you know you <laughs> it's nice when you get credited and we it like is. it when it we is. get credited yeah and that's 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 one of the things you know this video was provided and we got that credit information usually in our web pages too yeah. uh, most of the sdo stuff is for is freely available right. um there's a few every once in a while i think we've had a few things that have uh, some data set that is kind of proprietary actually one thing i was wondering about for you guys do you guys do anything with the gong project yes i said i ah. need a lot you okay so. Yeah, because I, I had been meaning to actually try to do a visual of the views from the different stations and sync them all up one time for like a day or two uh, right. of that, because I thought that was a, we, um, I had done a, a story a few years back uh, where we had where we got to use some some data from BBSO and I had not used it before. And I and and but in the process, I tracked down where all this other stuff was. I'm like, oh. Okay, let me. So I, I never, I, it's still, I, there's still a placeholder in one of my, my, uh, in the SVS database for, for that animation if I ever finish it. <laughs> but yep. yeah, I was wondering whether you guys actually, uh, could fill in gaps like that for the Gong project. I don't know if there, if there's any requirement or, we have about 60 like gigabytes of images and video store. We have the largest repository in the world of solar images and movies from, from high-end imagers inside the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. And I'm 100% certain it is the largest repository on Earth of, of that kind of thing. Um, getting to it and accessing it is another story. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So <laughs> uh, in order to uh, be able to publish this on YouTube and all that, um, to anybody else, because we're going to... We're going to get down to our our particular time limit. Okay. Oh, but, do you guys um put together um like metadata, like uh, make your data available in like a FITS format or something similar? That no, has, we don't. Uh, not not that we don't want to. We just don't know how to. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, we are um, doing a study on sunspit. We're trying to reclassify uh, sunspot and prominence configurations yeah, yeah, and sizes. Yeah. Um, right now, but we don't really. Uh, you know, I, I'm the only guy really that that runs it. That, and, that, uh, okay. And I have this a ton of data, and I ain't gonna live forever. So I need to find a way to, to make um, it available. Yeah, that would be a so. shame. Yeah. Um, actually, we'll uh, you have my work email address, right? Yeah. Probably it's available on the website too. Uh, I might want to correspond with because that that's something that I'm mildly curious about mm -hmm. is trying to trying to get metadata on this. I don't know how much you've actually got, but sometimes you can put like a minimal fits header on it where someone can at least make use of it. Yeah. And um, that might be that might uh, that was one of the problems I had um, the, when we did that thing with the solar telescope in the uh, was it the Canary Islands. We did a real close view and they were not using fits. Right. And I can tell you that that was a fact that gave me fits. <laughs> try to, try yeah, to I don't think anyone here in. is publishing in fits either. I think they're all TIFFs or JPEGs on our page. But yeah, anyway, but there's a way you can convert story. them. I mean, I put I pull this stuff out and convert it into TIFFs all the time. And they're revert and the tools are freely available now. So I might want um if there's anyone that's interested in that, I might be interested in in trying to see if if there's an easy way to do that because I do a lot of that conversion, mostly like I said, to, uh fits to TIFF, mm -hmm. but uh every once in a while I I can I can have experimented with the reverse of that, uh just to go make things so that so that they'll use my my code structures. So that might be something that uh, that we can share and maybe yeah, a project that, that might be helpful. worthwhile. Yeah. So if we okay. capture um, videos, we capture videos, if we capture them as an SCR, will the header file from the SCR go directly to a FITS if we then brought out the stools, uh, the single images of FITS file? Potentially, I, I I'm not sure what I I'm not familiar with that. Which you say it's a video format? S E R. You say yeah, which is the scientific video format, which sort of matches the fits. But I don't know whether the... I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a animated uh, tiff, well, so or it's animated basically, fit it's file, basically, basically a sequence of still images. It is. Do you yeah. have like timing information, accurate timing information on it, or? 
Yes. It, okay. It's, it's commonly yeah. used in astrophotography for videos. Oh, is this for like the the stacking and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's what you capture. And, okay. In, in some cameras, it's what you capture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or you're like raw format or something like that. But yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll I'll try to take a um. Yeah. Let me make a note about that and. Uh, I'll try to take a look at at some of that format there and see if maybe there's something that uh, that we can do on that. I mean, Python code, you know, uh, the the Python library that I use, uh, I've actually got it kind of standardized now, so that you can make if you use the the Anaconda module, you can make a, a matching uh, install package with the exact same versions of the libraries and stuff like that, and so it, it's. You know, I, I since AJ started working with me, and I've had to make it so my stuff so other someone else can run it. I've had to go and start paying attention to this stuff right, and, right. and standardizing it a little bit. Um, so right. yeah, so there's some possibilities there. So I, I'm I might be uh, interested in looking at, at that and see if uh, see if we can get something something going on that. But yeah, I'll, I'll need to get send myself a, you Steve you or someone send me a little reminder saying uh, you want to look at this, but. But uh, yeah, because that sounds like it might be a fun project, especially especially if we can preserve some data for others to use. Because I, you know, some of these repositories, I mean, they're huge, but you know, astronomy is one of the few fields where amateurs make significant contributions. Right. And to be able to preserve as much of that data as possible, I mean, there, I know AstroPy is being used by some people for, by amateur astrophotographers. And making FITS files available for some of their shots, so that would that um, I I I can see SunPy being used for something that could do convert regular so imagery taken with Earth-based cameras into stuff, especially if it's floating point. Um, I've got a, a <laughs> camera that I use that does raw format that gives you a slightly higher color depth that uh, is useful for that. Yeah, and, and SDOs is what twelve bit? I think they're twelve bit on SDO. So we now we are on a uh, we are on a hard boundary now because my wife has determined that our solar chat telcon for February is officially over. <laughs> Oops. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> I love all you guys, and I'm so grateful everybody showed up. And this will be on YouTube, and in a couple of hours, as soon as I can decode it and put it up. And um, I hope this is the last time we hear from you, uh, Tom. And okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, thanks, I'll, everybody. I'm, I'm curious about what's because I I can see where some of your imagery it might be useful to build to make you make uh, other use of it. I'll talk to the, the comms people that I work with. Very good. And see what kind of of uh, options there might be available to to do interact with more amateur groups, especially for this helio big year thing. If if any, is anyone here on the track to either of these eclipses or or really close to it? Oh, not close. I'm driving to it. Yeah. Me too. Okay. <laughs> okay yeah i'm not close my my wife's from buffalo and so but she says it's not worth going to buffalo in april <laughs> so, yeah. so but uh, all right all very right, good take care. we we'll will get back touch. to all this and i appreciate you coming and so long until next month solar chat folks good day right. thank, thank you, you. Bye. Bye. take care Bye. Bye.